high in the mountains of Scandinavia, nine Norwegian paratroopers race through the cold black night. They have just completed a successful raid on a remote Nazi-controlled hydroelectric plant, destroying over 1,000 pounds of a mysterious substance known as heavy water. The only thing the soldiers knew about heavy water was that if the Nazis got their hands on enough, they could create a weapon of unprecedented power. All around them, in Nazi-occupied Norway, their people were being persecuted and killed. Nevertheless, these commandos traveled over 60 miles, survived the Norwegian winter, and overcame incredible odds to execute the most successful sabotage mission of World War II and stop the Nazis from creating an atomic bomb. After the discovery of nuclear fission in 1938, the Nazi regime called upon Germany's top physicists to harness its power into a nuclear weapon. The physicists required heavy water, a form of water containing a hydrogen isotope, to facilitate nuclear fission. The only problem was that heavy water is almost non-existent in nature and takes massive amounts of energy to isolate. The only place on Earth that isolated heavy water in large quantities was the Vemork hydroelectric plant in Rukan, Norway. The company that owned the plant, Norsk Hydro, primarily produced fertilizer with heavy water only being a byproduct. When the Germans invaded Norway in the spring of 1940, the Nazis seized Vemork and all heavy water production within. Leif Tronstad was a Norwegian military officer, renowned professor at the Norwegian Institute of Technology, and a successful scientist who had researched heavy water extensively. Tronstad had also worked at Vemork and was familiar with the plant's heavy water production. Following the Nazi invasion, Tronstad spent a year resisting the Nazi regime in Norway before eventually escaping to Britain, where he was put in charge of Kompany Linga, a commando unit of Norwegian refugees based in Britain. Kompany Linga's main goal was to carry out attacks and raids on German-controlled Norwegian land. Members of Kompany Linga had to destroy Norwegian industry, raid their own cities, and destroy their homes, all in hopes of resisting the oppressive Nazi dictatorship. Then, in 1941, Leif Tronstad received information that the Nazis were going to use heavy water from Vemork to create nuclear weaponry. Tronstad knew that immediate action must be taken. Vemork had to be sabotaged and its heavy water supply destroyed. The first phase of the sabotage mission was a four-man operation known as Operation Grouse. The soldiers were to parachute into the mountains of Norway, ski to Vemork, and wait for two gliders, each containing 15 British combat engineers, to land at their location. The British troops, codenamed Operation Freshman, would then infiltrate the plant and destroy its heavy water supply with explosives. On October 19, 1942, the four members of Operation Grouse, Jens Anton Poulsen, Arne Schellstrup, Knut Haugland, and Klaus Helberg dropped onto the desolate Hardanger Plateau in central Norway with 500 pounds of supplies, including 10 days of rations, tents, light firearms, and skis. In order to remain undetected, the members of Grouse had been dropped roughly 30 miles west of Vemork, a two-day ski for the expert skiers. The winter of 1942 is still the hardest winter on record in Norway, with 25% higher than average snowfall and record low temperatures with an average of 8 degrees Fahrenheit. These factors slowed Operation Grouse's progress to a crawl, and their planned two-day mission took 15 days. On top of that, the four men had decided to leave half of their food rations behind in order to keep their packs light. The team had to fight through grueling conditions, exhaustion, malnutrition, and the fear of being discovered. Finally, they arrived at a small, abandoned mountain cabin close to Vemork, where they were finally able to make radio contact back to London and tell Company Linga they were in position. Operation Freshman was a go. Operation Freshman had to be postponed several times due to weather conditions. On the 19th of November, Freshman's captain ordered the British commandos to begin the mission despite continued poor weather. The thick clouds and turbulent skies caused the glider's transponders to cut out. Freshmen had no way of locating their landing site and were forced to turn back, but the pilots lost control of the gliders and they both spiraled down towards the mountains below. Most of the troops were killed instantly by the crash. The few who survived were quickly located by the Gestapo. They were then interrogated, tortured, and executed. Operation Freshman had failed. Now. Company Linga had to scramble to launch a second sabotage attempt. In the meantime, the isolated Grouse team was left alone with no food for an unknown period of time, forced to survive through an unforgiving Norwegian winter. All four members of Grouse managed to endure for four months in the mountains through the bitter cold and merciless blizzards. 
Hiding in their abandoned cabin, they were forced to stave off starvation by eating wild moss and lichen buried in the snow, and hunting reindeer. Through all of this, their greatest challenge was remaining undetected by the soldiers stationed at Baymork. Finally, on February 16th, the four men received a message from London. A six-man Norwegian team, codenamed Operation Gunnerside, had been deployed onto the Hardanger Plateau. The Gunnerside team was led by Joachim Runeberg, with Knut Haukled, Kasper Idland, Birger Strumsheim, Frederick Kaiser, and Hans Storhaug making up the other five members. With Haugland staying behind to provide updates to London, the other nine resistance fighters prepared to infiltrate Vemork in five days' time. All nine men knew the importance of the mission, but also understood the incredible difficulty and danger. Being located on a mountainside already provided Vemork with impressive natural defenses. However, since Operation Freshman's failure, the Germans suspected Vemork was being targeted. Security had been upgraded. Troops were now stationed round the clock. Mines had been planted, and a barbed wire fence had been installed. The only entrance to the plant was a heavily guarded suspension bridge stretched across a 600-foot ravine. With all these factors in mind, the members of Grouse and Gunnerside were well aware that their odds of surviving were low. They knew this was likely a suicide mission. On February 28, 1943, just after midnight, the nine commandos skied towards Vemork. Unable to infiltrate the plant via the bridge or mountainside, the commandos made the decision to descend the 600-foot ravine, cross the icy river beneath, and climb back up the other side. Then, the group cut through the outer fence using a single pair of wire cutters. Once inside the complex, the saboteurs split up. Runeberg, Idland, Strumsheim, and Kaiser moved in as the demolition crew, as the other five stayed near the on-site barracks to provide cover in case a gunfight occurred. Moving swiftly and silently across the grounds, Runeberg's squad made their way toward their target. During their training, members of both operations had memorized blueprints and layouts of Vemork. They knew every inch of the grounds and were able to arrive at the heavy water storage building undetected. From here, Runeberg and Kaiser climbed through an open cable shaft to reach the cellar where the heavy water was kept. Strumsheim and Idland came in through a window. Once inside, Runeberg and Strumsheim attached the explosives to the heavy water containers. In one of the most daring decisions of the operation, Runeberg cut the fuses on the explosives, meaning that they would detonate 30 seconds after being lit. Once Runeberg lit the fuse, he and his men raced out of the cellar and back towards the barracks to rejoin their comrades. A muffled blast confirmed that the mission had been a success. As the Norwegians raced away into the night, half a year's supply of heavy water spilled out of its tank and down the drain in the basement floor. Not a single shot had been fired, and all nine resistance fighters made it out alive. After the mission was completed, the saboteurs went their separate ways. Polson, Helberg and Haugland stayed near their hometown of Rukan. Ronneberg led the other members of Gunnerside on a 150-mile ski to reach safety in Sweden, except for Knut Haukled, who led another sabotage mission that sank the SF Hydro, a German ship set to carry the last of Vemork's heavy water to Germany. Afterward, Haukled traveled to Oslo with Erna Schellstrup to continue working with the Norwegian resistance. Leif Tronstad, the sabotage's mastermind, was tragically shot and killed by a Nazi sympathizer in 1945. He died protecting his country and his people. The German occupation was a dark time for Norway. Its land was invaded, its government was destroyed, and its citizens were oppressed and killed. Over the course of the war, the Nazis killed 10,000 Norwegians. The brave Norwegian soldiers of Grouse and Gunnerside managed to fight back against their captors, but they had to launch an attack on their own country to do so as was the case for countless other Norwegian resistance movements. In pursuit of keeping the Nazis from a nuclear bomb, 30 men lost their lives. Finally, there is the matter of the atomic bomb itself. Even if the sabotage kept Hitler from winning the race to a nuclear weapon, the overarching tragedy is that anybody won that race at all. However, despite all the darkness surrounding the lives of Norwegians during this time, the bright light of determination shines through in the actions of the patriots who risked their lives for the good of their people. The brilliance of Tronstadt and company Linga to devise the original plan. The perseverance of Graus when all seemed hopeless. And the heroics of Gunnerside to keep the Nazis from doing further harm to anyone. It was all a triumphant testament to the human spirit. <laughs>